Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sarah from Dental Pass, your best online mentor for the preparation of IMBD, ADAT and AFK exam. Today I have taken a topic of paleo, that's a very important topic we have is flap surgery because you always have lots of questions coming from here. It's important for us to understand the concepts involved. Let us start with this video. First of all, we should know what is a flap. If you define a flap, a periodontal flap is a section of gingiva and or mucosa surgically separated from the underlying tissue to provide visibility and access to the bone and the root surface. When you raise a flap or when you reflect a flap, always remember the flap is still attached at the apical end and free at one end that is the coronal end. So if you compare it with the graft, the graft which is a completely detached piece of tissue, flap is still attached at the apical end. Flap still maintain its own blood supply. While a graft does not maintain its own blood supply, it will restore its blood supply from the recipient blood vessel. Let us talk about the indications and contraindication of the flaps. So indication is when you have deep craters, irregular bony contour, grade 2 or grade 3 furcation involvement, root dissection, hemisection, infrabony or the deep pocket where the base of the pocket is apical to the mucogingival junction or apical to the alveolar crest. Persistent inflammation in the area with the moderate to the deep pocket. But of course, you have to control the inflammation first, then only you can go for surgery. Also for the pockets on the teeth in which a complete removal of root irritant is not possible clinically. So if your SRP itself is not sufficient in that case, of course, we have to go for a surgical approach. Now the contraindication for the flap is uncontrolled medical condition like uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, unstable angina if patient has a heart attack or a stroke within the last six months, uh, poor plaque control and high KD state. Always you have to remember that when we start your treatment planning for the PO patient, the first phase is the emergency phase when you deal with any emergency. Then we start with the phase one which is the initial phase where you do the SRPs, scaling root planing. But after doing the SRP, when you recall the patient in four to six weeks of time, you have to be sure that the patient has maintained good oral hygiene in the meantime. He has followed your oral hygiene instruction. But if it, that is not the case and you don't see good hygiene in the patient, you don't go to the phase two or the surgical phase. You keep on continuing your phase one until the patient hygiene is improved. Because if you are doing surgery in the patient who has a bad hygiene, it is going to further deteriorate his condition after surgery, infections will be there. If we classify the flap here, classification is those based on bone exposure after the flap reflection. We have two types of flap, full thickness flap and the partial thickness flap. Full thickness flap students are the mucoperiosteal flap in which the periosteum of the bone is also reflected along with the flap. While the partial thickness flap is a split thickness where the periosteum is still on the bone, it is not the part of your flap. So in case of full thickness flap, your bone is going to get exposed while not in the partial thickness flap. Now what is the indication, which type of case do you give partial thickness, where you give full thickness, we are going to discuss it in the coming slides. Also the flap can be classified based on if they are displaced after the surgery or they are not displaced. So once you reflect the flap, if you are displacing it apically, coronally, laterally, or you are not displacing the flap, you're raising the flap, you're doing your procedure, and then you're putting the flap into the same position like your modified ridden flap is one of the undisplaced flap we have. So undisplaced flap definitely are more conservative flaps. Also, the flap is classified based on management of the papilla. So if you are going to have a conventional flap or you have a papilla preservation flap in which you are not splitting the interproximal papilla. Now let us look at the pictures here. So you can see this full thickness flap. The periosteum is also reflected. It's also a part of your flap and the entire bone is being exposed here. So in case of resective osseous surgery, like you do ostectomy, when you are removing the bone, that are resective osseous surgery or the subtractive osseous surgeries. So you can see we are raising the flap. This is a periosteal elevator by which we can raise the full thickness flap. But full thickness flap may not be indicated in the area where alveolar bone is thin or area where treatment for osseous defect with the mucogingival problem is not required or thin perio tissue with probable osseous dehiscence and fenestration cases. Now what is dehiscence and fenestration? It's going to come in the coming slides here. Now when we talk about the partial thickness flap, they are the split thickness flap. Where periosteum is still on the bone, it covers the bone. These flaps are uh, reflected or raised by using a surgical blade because they're very thin flap. 
on the recipients based on the flap placement after surgery as we already discussed the non-displaced and the displaced flaps and based on the design of the flap now you can see some of the pictures here you have the split the papilla flap the conventional flap in which you are splitting the interproximal papilla if you can see the picture here but this one you can see the interproximal papilla is still a part of the flap so this is called as a papilla preservation flap in a conventional flap, you can see the interdental papilla, it is split. You see in the picture, this is the pegostial elevator we have. It is split beneath the contact point of the two approximating teeth to allow reflection on both the lingual and the buccal flaps. We are using the conventional flap when, for example, when we are displacing the flap or when the interdental spaces are too narrow. So your MWF, undisplaced flap, apically displaced flap, the flap for regenerative procedure like for the grafting, conventional flaps can be used. Now if you look at the picture here, this is the papilla preservation flap we have, which incorporates the entire papilla in one of the flap. You can see the picture here, this is the interproximal papilla. Now two basic flap design, those with and those without the vertical releasing incision. Number one we have here is the envelope flaps. So envelope flap is just with the horizontal incision, it's just like open and close envelope flap. You can look at the picture. There are only horizontal incisions which are given here. We'll discuss about the horizontal and vertical releasing incision in the coming one minute. While the pedicle flap, you can see in the picture, it is going to have two vertical releasing incisions. So vertical releasing incisions are given at the line angles of the tooth in a diverging incisions. You can see vertical releasing. And then this is the triangular flap. If you can look at the picture, which is having a horizontal incision and there's only one vertical releasing incision is given, so it's taking a shape of a triangle. Now, if we talk about the next one here, you can see the flap incisions now. There are basically two major incisions we have in flap surgery, horizontal incision and the vertical releasing incision. Let us talk about the horizontal incisions first. Horizontal incisions are given horizontally. They are directed along the gingival margin in a mesial or the distal direction. Basically, we have two types of horizontal incision. We have the internal bevel incision and the cravicular incision. What is internal bevel incision and why it is called as internal bevel? See, internal bevel incision is named so because the direction of the incision is internal here. It starts from the gingival margin towards the alveolar crest, you can see. So this alveolar crest here, the bone, and the direction is like this, is internal. And beveled incision. You are not giving a flat cut with your surgical blade. You are giving a cut at 30 to 45 degrees. That's a beveled cut. Now, second incision you can see. So this incision is not given in the sulcus. It is given 1 to 3 millimeter away from the gingival sulcus or the gingival crevice. While the crevicular, the second incision is given directly into the sulcus called as the sulcular incision or the crevicular incision. This incision will start at the bottom of the pocket and direct it towards the bone. So you can see the second one. The second one you can see it directly going into the sulcus, into the crevice. This is the second incision. This is the first incision internal bevel. You can see it's away from the gingival margin. And this is second incision directly into the sulcus. The third incision is the interdental incision. And that incision is given after the flap is elevated. So by giving the primary and the secondary incision, because internal bevel is the very first incision of area surgery, it's called as a primary incision. And the second incision is your crevicular or the circular incision. Internal bevel is also called as a scalloped incision. First you get the first incision and the second incision, you can see a V-shaped wedge like tissue you can remove here. The third incision is the interdental incision you are doing uh, using the urban knife or the Kirkland knife to give the interdental incision but that incision is given after the flap is elevated so if you look at this this is the internal bevel first incision primary incision also called as a reverse bevel incision and you are using 11 or 15 number surgical blade it started at distance one to three millimeter away from the gingival margin you can see in the picture very clearly it is aiming towards the alveolar crest so this incision, it works to remove the pocket lining. Giving a beveled incision helps in producing a sharp thin flap margin and start from the designated area on the gingiva and is directed to an area near the crest of the bone. So if you can look at the picture here closely, this is the incision. It's not the incision that you give into the sulcus, no. This incision internal bevel is one to three millimeter away from the circular or the gingival margin. This is the very first incision that we say as internal bevel. Now the second incision as I told you is the crevicular incision, second incision 
and you take the incision directly into the sulcus. You give the incision directly into the sulcus or into the gingival crevice. You can see this arrow here, the black arrow, number two, made from the base of the pocket to the crest of the bone. This incision, together with the first incision, it will form a V-shaped wedge ending at or near the crest of the bone. Using your surgical blade, periosteal elevator, it is inserted into initial internal bevel incision. The flap, you can see how it is separated from the bone. Then once the flap is elevated by using your periosteal elevator, then you are giving the interdental incision, also known as a third incision, to separate the collar of the gingiva that is left around the tooth. And the incision is made facially, lingually, interdentally connecting the two segments. So you can use the Orbis knife for giving the interdental incision.